early morning hours of July 16, 1945, the world's first atomic bomb detonated in the New Mexican desert, releasing a level of destructive power unknown in the existence of humanity. The first successful test of an atomic bomb, known as the Trinity Test, forever changed the history of the world. Countless hours of work and research by top scientists, the US military, and over 100,000 civilian workers led to this revolutionary experiment under the top secret Manhattan Project. The road to the Trinity Test and the dropping of the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki may have begun before the start of World War II, but the war brought the creation of atomic weaponry to fruition. How did humanity come to construct and wield such a devastating weapon? How was history shaped by these actions? How does it still affect our lives today? Stay tuned. These questions will all be answered now in the Manhattan Project electronic field trip. Welcome to the National World War II Museum right here in New Orleans, Louisiana. We're broadcasting live from the museum to thousands of classrooms all across the country. My name is D1 and I'm a rapper, but I'm also a former teacher from right here in New Orleans. Now we are so excited to have you join us from your school to discover the science and history behind the Manhattan Project. Today, the story will be brought to you by four student reporters stationed here in New Orleans, in Los Alamos, New Mexico, and Hanford, Washington. They will each share with us the important contributions and the sweeping changes that happened in their home communities because of this major scientific endeavor. This program is designed to be so interactive, so you will not just be watching, you'll be taking part in the discussion. That's right. You'll be asking questions live to nuclear research professor Sharon Squassoni. If you're watching this on the museum's website, you can ask questions and answer polls in the box directly below this screen. Or you can go to slido.com and type in the code hashtag MPEFT to join in the conversation. You can also ask questions via Twitter. Now don't get in trouble in school for using your cell phone, but if you go on Twitter, you can use the hashtag MPEFT, all right? Museum educators are standing by waiting to answer your question. ASL interpretation and captioning of this program in English and Spanish are also available below. Now let's dive right in and turn to our student reporter, Julia, who is in the Manhattan Project Gallery of the museum. But first, Let's open the first poll question. What is the atomic number of an element? A, the amount of atoms needed for a nuclear reaction. B, the number of protons in the nucleus of an atom. C, the number of electrons in an atom. Or D, the amount of atoms needed to form a molecule. Now go and vote right now and the answer will be revealed when we come back. Take it away, Julia. Today, our journey begins in the National World War II Museum's Manhattan Project exhibit in the Arsenal Democracy Gallery to learn about the origins of atomic energy. Hi, I'm Julia Hutto and I'm a high school student right here in New Orleans, Louisiana. I've been a youth volunteer here at the museum for three years. Before we talk about the Manhattan Project, we have to cover some basics. Let's start with atoms. They are the smallest unit of matter, or physical substance. The solids, liquids, and gas around us are composed of atoms. The chair you're sitting in, the eyes you're using to watch this electronic field trip, and the screen you're watching it on are all made of atoms. And you probably know the different subatomic particles of atoms, protons, neutrons, and electrons. The positively charged protons and the neutral neutrons form the nucleus of the atom, and the negatively charged electrons exist outside of the nucleus. Here with me is Rob Wallace, head of STEM education here at the museum to review World War II era research on atoms and their significance. Thanks for joining me, Rob. I'm excited to be here with you and to show you around this great gallery. Now, Rob, as we know, there are many different elements on the periodic table. Two that are important to what we'll be talking about today are uranium and plutonium. Now, what makes two atoms different from one another? Well, what makes one atom itself and not any other element is the number of protons it has in its nucleus. Let's look at this dia these diagrams to show us. So if you'll choose uranium there, 
it'll show you how uranium is made. Uranium has 92 protons in its nucleus. Uh, in its nucleus are protons and neutrons. If it changes the number of protons, then it becomes another element. If it adds a proton, then it becomes neptunium. If it adds two, then it becomes plutonium. But you could change the number of neutrons and not change elements. Then you become a different isotope of the same element. Now, why are isotopes important? Well, isotopes are important because different isotopes have different stabilities. They last longer, they have different uh, properties of fission, which means breaking apart. And there, are, there is one isotope of uranium that they tend to use in nuclear weapons, and one of plutonium that they also use among the, among the many. Now, what exactly is a nuclear reaction? Well, a nuclear reaction is where the atoms split in half. In a regular chemical reaction, you break one atom from another, and in a nuclear reaction, it's called fission, and you can see it here on the diagram. You're going to get a, a nucleus splitting in half, and that way you get atomic energy. When a nucleus splits, a tremendous amount of energy is released, and new, lighter elements are created. In addition to the release of energy, several more neutrons come out of the reaction. The release of a large amount of energy in many, many instances of fission could result in a massive explosion. So Julia, all that science that we talked about over there, all those discoveries occurred mostly in Germany. In 1938, a lab discovered fission of uranium, and Lisa Meitner coined that term, fission, when she looked at the data. What else was going on in Europe at that time in around 1938? So while Germany does not invade Poland until 1939, Europe is on the brink of World War II. So that was a scary time and a scary place for so much power to be in somebody's hands. The refugees fled because they were living in the shadow of Hitler. Let's take a look at a cool artifact here. This is a letter from uh, two refugees, one of whom is somebody you might have heard of. Albert Einstein. Yep, Albert Einstein, you can see his signature here. And who did he write this letter to? President Roosevelt. That's right, so another scientist, Leo Szilard, met with Einstein and tried to convince him to write a letter to Roosevelt because Einstein was such a prominent figure that Roosevelt might pay attention. And they wanted to outline and point out to Roosevelt what they were concerned about, which is that with the science being developed in Germany, that Hitler would be the first to develop nuclear power into a weapon. And so they wrote this letter and it got to the desk of Roosevelt and they decided to um, act and develop the Manhattan Project. Einstein encouraged Roosevelt to speed up experimental work by providing funds and perhaps also by obtaining the cooperation of industrial laboratories which have the necessary equipment. This letter also warned Roosevelt that Germany had access to uranium ore from Czechoslovakia and that the U.S. government needed to support uranium research. Did Einstein actually work on the Manhattan Project? Uh, no, he didn't. That was towards the end of his career. Um, but he, at the end, after the bomb was used, he was actually really horrified by the effects of the bomb and was sorry that he had participated in it. Um, but more on that later. Rob, thanks so much for your time. Right here in the United States, scientific experimentation took us from the first sustained chain reaction, which couldn't even power a light bulb in late 1942, to the test and usage of destructive atomic weapons less than three years later. The pace of innovation is staggering. Thanks for the insight into atomic fundamentals, Rob and Julia. Now let's reveal the answer to the first poll question. What is the atomic number of an element? The answer is B. It's the number of protons in the nucleus of an atom. You can find the atomic number in the top of the box of each element on the periodic table. The atomic number of uranium is 92, and the atomic number of plutonium is 94. Now let's take a second to review the science covered in that last segment. When a nucleus of an atom splits, it's called fission. Fission releases a tremendous amount of energy, 
much more than a conventional chemical reaction like TNT. This type of release is called atomic energy. Let's bring in our special guest to explain more about how scientists were trying to harness the power of atomic energy. Ah, thank you so, so, so <laughs> much for being with us, Professor Squassoni. It's my pleasure, thanks for having me. Of course, now, the bulletin is based out of Chicago, Illinois, and you have an important story about a revolutionary experiment related to the atomic energy at the uh, University of Chicago. I want you to tell us a bit about what happened there underneath the stands of the University Football Stadium in 1942. Exactly. So Enrico Fermi had his laboratory. He was in charge of uh, putting together the first nuclear reactor. What it, they needed to do was demonstrate that you could sustain this fissile reaction, the chain reaction. And so they put together the, what they called the Chicago Pile 1. Uh, which was literally a pile of graphite, graphite blocks, very artfully arranged, and some uranium. And what they managed to do in 1942 was demonstrate that you could control this chain reaction. Now in a nuclear reactor, the, f the fissile chain reaction is controlled. In a bomb, it's not. Wow, um, why is that experiment so important to our story? Well, um, you know, the Manhattan Project had organizations all over the country, and some of them were working on different pieces of it. So the Chicago uh, Metallurgical Lab uh, was working on how do you produce plutonium, and ultimately you produce plutonium in this reactor from the transmutation of uranium. So that was an incredibly important part. Um, our, the second bomb, actually the first test we did, used plutonium, so that's why it was important. Gotcha. Now, um, my, uh, my favorite part of today's broadcast is that we have thousands of students all around the country watching this. So I'd like for everyone, every student, no matter what part of the country you're in, if you are watching this, I want you to yell out the name of your school on the count of three. You ready? One, One two, two, three. three. <laughs> I think I heard all of y'all. I, th I think I heard you. Okay, good. This is gonna be a great, uh, great day, great broadcast for y'all. Now. I want to turn to some student questions since we have so many students watching this. So let's get to a few student questions. Hi, my name is Natalie and I'm a fifth grader from Carmel Elementary in Tennessee. We live about 200 miles from the secret city of Oak Ridge, Tennessee. My question is, how many women were involved in the Manhattan Project? That is a great question. So often we think of the physicists, you know, it's portrayed as uh, really a bunch of white geniuses who put the bomb together. The, it's not true. We had a, a, more than 130,000 people involved in the Manhattan Project, and a good portion of them were women. And you know why? Because we were in the middle of a war. Mm. And so the United States needed all the talent it could get, and guess what? About half that talent resided in women. We all know that women are more talented than men. Thank I mean, you. I, I can't lie. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's just a fact. But. Uh, <laughs> Let's take another student question, if you don't okay. mind. Let's get another question from a student. All right, this one comes from Caleb in Tacoma, Washington. He says, did people from every state work on the Manhattan Project? Every state, 50 states. Did people from every state work on the Manhattan Project? Oh, you know, I don't know if it was from every state. Okay. But the, but the effort was, uh, came from all across, you know, very many states and you might wonder why I'm wearing these purple gloves. Yes. Um, we have an artifact from the museum. Is that a think if we can, dog, a cat, a It duck, is a, a cat, chicken? and I don't know if you can get a close-up. It's the Atom Cat. Uh, <laughs> uh, the Atom a Cat, but at Atom. Yeah, Adam. exactly. Oh, wow, this comes so from cool. Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and uh, towards the top, I don't know if you can see, we actually have someone f who was from New Orleans. From New Orleans. Uh, who worked on the project. So um, I don't know if every state in the union was involved, but certainly many, many efforts. Wow, that's extremely creative. You got it? Yeah. All right. All right, let's, uh, let's open up the next poll question. Where does the element plutonium get its name? Ooh. A, from Roman mythology. B, from Mickey Mouse's pet dog. 
see from the dwarf planet in our solar system or D from the lab where it was discovered? Now I want you all to vote now and stay tuned for the answer. Now we're going to journey all the way from New Orleans to southeastern Washington state to learn how the work in nuclear energy became more organized after the U.S. entered World War II. So take it away, Sarah. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah and I live on the sunny side of Washington State. Here we have random tumbleweeds, gorgeous mountains, and a beautiful Columbia River which produces a tremendous amount of hydroelectric power for the U.S. All around us you can see bluffs, wildlife, and natural vegetation. Throughout history, this area contained American Indian villages and was utilized for fishing and hunting. It's also been used for trapping, mining, ranching, and most recently, irrigation and farming. Flashback to 1942. At this point, the United States was wrapped up in World War II. The Pacific Fleet was attacked at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. The day after, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt gave an impassioned speech to Congress to declare war on Japan. Shortly thereafter, Germany declared war on the United States. Remember Einstein's letters to FDR about uranium fission and Germany's potential capabilities? Well, by 1942, the U.S. government decided to move forward with a full-scale investment in the bomb program. Here to tell us more is Robert Franklin. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me. Why is it called the Manhattan Project if we're nowhere near Manhattan? Well, that's a really good question. So this was a top secret, very, very top secret project. Even the name of the project, didn't they didn't want that to give anything away. So they decided to name the project out of the office which ran it, which was in Manhattan. General Leslie Groves was appointed to lead this top secret project. Groves, known for leading the construction of the Pentagon, now became responsible for managing a project that would coordinate the activities of these Manhattan project sites for one purpose, to build an atomic weapon. The challenges were immense, including how to keep it a secret, how to build all the necessary infrastructure, and how to keep American communities safe. It was a massive project that employed 130,000 workers and cost $2.2 billion, which is almost $40 billion today. Wait, so what exactly is this reactor behind us? So this is the B reactor, the world's first full-scale nuclear reactor. And this would take uranium and transform it into plutonium, which was used on in the atomic bombs. Why was Hanford chosen as a site? Well, a couple of reasons. Uh, there was a uh, the X-10 reactor in Oak Ridge, which was kind of like a pilot, like a baby of the B reactor behind us. But they didn't really want to put all their eggs in one basket because Oak Ridge was also enriching uranium. So they needed a location that was far away. They wanted somewhere out west. So uh, Lieutenant Colonel Franklin Mathias was assigned with finding a new location. And Hanford here had everything that they, that they needed. It was pretty rural. Uh, only about 1,500 people lived in the 600 or so square miles. That, that was taken for the Hanford site. It was pretty remote. Uh, in, in 1943, this, was, this wasn't a heavily populated area of Washington State. It had, the, like you mentioned, the beautiful Columbia River nearby, which flows year round with um, cool, pretty clean water that was used to, to um, cool the temperature of the reactor. So it was really a perfect confluence of factors. You mentioned that people were around here in town. Like, what happened to those people? Oh, that's a good question. So there were about 1,500 people um, in this area here that now comprises the Hanford site. And um, beginning in 1943, they got letters in the mail informing them that uh, because of the War Powers Act, the U.S. government was going to be taking their land. And also to these people, many of them thought this was home and, and they wanted to help the government in times of war, but it's hard to give up your home and to not know why. This was a top secret project. To learn more about it, why don't we go check out the old Hanford Town site? Cool, let's go. Whoa, what is this place? It looks haunted. Yeah, it's a little eerie, isn't it? This is the old Hanford High School uh, from, of course, a town named after the town of Hanford, and it's been abandoned now for over 75 years. So, like I said, everyone, all the residents here, the farmers and townspeople had to leave, and in their place, um, came, uh, was the Hanford Construction Camp, kind of where we are, we're in the northeast corner of that now. This area, 1,500 people, transformed into a city of 45,000 people, the fourth largest city in the state of Washington from 1943 through the early part of 1945. They came from all over, they came from, mostly from the south. Um, DuPont and the Army Corps rec recruited 
um, black and white workers um, to come here. Black workers at Hanford face segregation in employment and housing, both at the Hanford construction camp and in the surrounding towns. The rapid population growth revealed issues not only in housing, but civil rights and policing. In fact, Jim Crow style segregation really began here in the Pacific Northwest when black migrants moved here for war work. They recruited about 120,000 people, but only 45,000 were here at any one time because this was a very remote place. It was very, it was very harsh conditions. Because of all the construction and the winds, there would be massive dust storms that would make it, they'd turn the sky black. They would sometimes, um, they'd make it hard to breathe. They would, the dust would flow into buildings. It would pile up in windowsills. Um, and we were far away from a lot of other towns. So while the wages were good and the work was important, for some people, this was not a place they wanted to be during the war. But why don't we go back to the bee reactor to learn more about the making of plutonium? All right, let's go. Why is it called the B reactor? Oh, that's a really good question. So DuPont laid out um, a, certain, a number of areas and named them for letters of the alphabet, going A through F. So this is taking what Fermi had done in the University of Chicago, but expanding it in a big, big, big way, as you can see. So here's, here's the front face, 2004 tubes, uh, processed tubes in this graphite block. They didn't even know what they were doing in this entire time. Like they had no idea that they were building a nuclear reactor. They wouldn't have even known the words nuclear reactor. Earlier you were talking about how plutonium needs to be enriched to be a proper fuel for a bomb. Why is that? So plutonium is a very heavy and, and uh, unstable uh, element and so it, and it generates heat. Um, and so that's why it's great fuel for a bomb. This reactor behind us helps take uranium um, a, a, an element that's naturally that's a naturally occurring element and turn it into plutonium which is really doesn't occur in nature it's a man-made element. How does the reactor work? Well, let's head to the control room and find out. So we'll come around the corner and um, I mean, look at all of this, what looks to us like really old technology, chart paper, pressure tubes, dials, switches. You notice there's nothing digital here. So this entire reactor was operated in what we call like analog, right? They were, they were reading things on paper um, and on pressure, like pressure dials and things like that. Isn't that amazing? Like, this new technology was totally reliant on all these old, and most of these systems actually they got from the Navy. That's cool. All right, Sarah, so now we're here in the control room, and this is really kind of like the heart of the human activity of the reactor. And in this room, they're gonna monitor different things like the pressure behind us, and then the temperature gauges, which we'd be looking at. And that's gonna tell us um, how, how much, what level the reactor is operating at. And the physicist on staff is gonna be taking the temperature of each one of these um, tubes where the fuel are in, and that's, and the, the, that's gonna let them know uh, when they're at the right level that they want to discharge the fuel so they can get the plutonium out. And one of my favorite things in the control room is they would type in the pressures. So here's, here's the front face. Here's the hottest part of the front face. And this is like the outside not quite as hot. My favorite thing is that this is secret after fill-in because what they would fill in here is the temperature. So this sheet of paper is nothing, but the temperature the reactor operates tells you how much plutonium you're making and how much plutonium, or in the, in the 40s, what they would call product, is very secret. This seems dangerous and careful at the same time. How did it affect the people and wildlife? People would wear um, certain types of clothing uh, we, we would call them like whites, uh, um, overalls, coveralls. If they went into an area where there was above average radioactivity present, they would dress up, they would don clothes to protect them. They would wear dosimeters, either badges or pencils that would measure radiation in the air. We had never really produced plutonium at this kind of level before. So there, we weren't 
um, super knowledgeable about how this radioactivity would travel in the environment and how it would affect the environment. But uh, the main goal was to make plutonium. And so during the war, there were some emissions, um, higher, higher than would be allowed after the war. Wow, thank you so much. I learned a ton today. Thank you, Robert. Oh, you're welcome. The fuel for the atomic bomb was generated here and in Tennessee. The quest for these products changed the landscape greatly for the people of the past and the present. In the next segment, you'll hear from Isaac in New Mexico about constructing the actual bomb itself and another secret city filled with brilliant engineers and physicists tackling a particular challenge of the Manhattan Project. All right, we're back at the National World War II Museum with Sharon Squassoni to take a closer look at some clandestine activity at these laboratories and reactors. But first, let's reveal the answer to the second poll question. Where does the element plutonium get its name? The answer is C, from the dwarf planet Pluto. You may remember Rob mentioning uranium, neptunium, and plutonium in the first segment. Those are all named after planets. Now this is a big reminder to all students watching this. If you want to join today's discussion, I want you to go to slido.com and use the hashtag MPEFT or ask us questions on Twitter with the same hashtag. Make sure you tweet us, okay? And we're actually looking at every question that you all send. Now let's take a look at some authentic Manhattan Project artifacts from the museum's collection. First. Let's check out this service uniform with a Manhattan Project patch. Professor, what does this patch symbolize? Well, I'm glad you asked. This is an Army uniform, and you can see over here the patch is a triangular with the blue um, background symbolizes the universe. Uh, the star is the actual Army Engineer District. The question mark uh, has to do with secrecy. Uh, and then it kind of becomes a lightning bolt splitting the atom below. Pretty fancy, about 3,500 uh, staff members wore this insignia. I actually wish I could get one of those <laughs> to put on one of my jackets. That, that's actually really cool. I know it has a lot of significance. In Ask the museum. Ask the, Maybe ooh, the <laughs> hey, Chrissy! Yeah, we'll, we'll talk later. All right, anyway, we learned a bit about the top secret nature of the Manhattan Project in Hanford. We'll learn a bit more about that in the next segment in Los Alamos. However, even with the best intentions, these top secret, uh, you know, bits of information, they still go out sometimes, correct? Sure. So what you need to remember is that there was a lot of work going on in nuclear science uh, beginning in the 20s and 30s. And all of these scientists around the world were publishing and suddenly some of them stop publishing, right? So that's one uh, indicator that something secret was going on. But it was really a race to the bomb. Mm -hmm. And so um, in the US case, the most famous uh, spy was Klaus Fuchs, who was a German who had left Germany in 1933, went to the UK, and then he actually got seconded to the Los Alamos program where he started giving secrets to the Soviets. Oh my goodness, that guy. How did the Soviet <laughs> Union use that intelligence that they got from him? Well, it was terrific intelligence, right? So uh, they, there's one kind of ballpark estimate that it shortened or it, it sped up the Soviet program by about a year. Um, Fuchs was not the only spy, there were others. And uh, we ultimately learned that um, these spies were helping not just the uh, Russians fission weapon, but also the next big one, the thermonuclear weapon. Wow, that is extremely fascinating. Um, I would like to take a look at some student questions now. This okay. is one of my favorite parts. So let's take a video question. How are people recruited for the Manhattan Project? So that's a fascinating question. How do you get more than 100,000 people to go work on this project? So a lot of um, even graduate students were recruited mm. from universities. It was by word of mouth. Sometimes Enrico Fermi would call someone up. And there was a really fantastic uh, anecdote about a woman scientist who noticed some of her colleagues were missing and then the big Van de Graaff piece of equipment went missing, and then she got a phone call asking her 
to go work on a wartime project. And when she went into the library to look up a book uh, about Los Alamos, she discovered all the colleagues that were missing had signed that book out. <laughs> so um, it was really, uh, it, it was kind of in a secret way, but I'm sure there were other, uh, other more open ways of recruiting people. Wow. Okay, let's go to a live question next. This is from Ethan M. What up, Ethan? Is an atomic bomb and a nuclear bomb the same thing? Absolutely. So we use atomic and nuclear to interchangeably. They are the same thing. That's How the same thing? It is. However, there are two different kinds of bombs. Okay. One is a fission bomb, and that's what we've been talking about. And then there's a thermonuclear bomb, and that uses usually fission and fusion together. But let's not get into that. Okay, so basically, <laughs> students, whenever you hear someone saying an atomic bomb or a nuclear bomb, that's the same, same thing. thing. Those are just synonyms, literally the same thing. And you know what? Big shout out to all the students. Y'all are doing so great. I can tell if you're really enjoying this, on behalf of your teachers, I would like to propose that any teacher whose class is watching this, how about you give these students some extra credit on their next test? <laughs> how about 50 points of extra credit right now? Signed, <laughs> sealed, and delivered. Okay, anyway, back to, back to the program. Let's open up for our next poll question. <clears throat> what is Trinitite? A, the base of lots of good old New Orleans cooking made of onions, bell pepper, and celery. B, the name of the B-29 bomber that dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. C, a glass-like mineral created from the first atomic bomb blast. Or D, the code name of the proposed Allied invasion of Japan. We will reveal the answer after the next segment. But continuing our story is Isaac in Los Alamos, New Mexico. This is arguably the most famous Manhattan Project site where elite scientists all gathered to conduct experiments and manufacture detonators for the potential weapon. Located on the Parito Plateau, Los Alamos is a picturesque town perched on a mesa in northern New Mexico. It was once home to Pueblo villages, ranches, and homesteads. The surrounding land was used for hunting, gathering, farming, and ranching for nearly a thousand years. Similar to Hanford and Oak Ridge though, this area went through rapid changes as it was selected as a site for the Manhattan Project. Hey everyone, my name is Isaac and I live in Los Alamos in northern New Mexico. Today I'm at the Bradbury Science Museum at Los Alamos National Laboratories. I'm joined today with Elliot Schultz, a historian of science at the museum, who's hopefully going to share a couple stories of the town and the lab. Thank you for joining me. Pleasure to be here, Isaac. So why was this area chosen for the lab? So the reason why Los Alamos was chosen is very similar to the stories of Oak Ridge and Hanford. Uh, the military needed a place that was remote and isolated where scientists and engineers could come together to uh, solve very serious technical problems related to the development of the atomic bomb. And while many scientists and engineers throughout Europe and the United States were confident that an atomic bomb could be constructed, a lot of the research was very slow and disorganized. And so General Groves thought that everybody should come together in one central location where this research could be done. And why don't we go into the town of Los Alamos and we can talk a little bit more about the history of how this laboratory was founded. Sounds good. So behind us here is Fuller Lodge, which was actually part of the Los Alamos Ranch School, a uh, school for wealthy boys uh, in the early 1900s. And it was this building, and there were a lot of other buildings in the area, mainly homesteads from people that were living down halfway between Los Alamos and Santa Fe, that formed more or less Los Alamos before the Manhattan Project came in 1943. So who was Oppenheimer and what did he do? 
So Oppenheimer was actually the director of Los Alamos National Laboratory, and he was one of the most prominent theoretical physicists in the country. Uh, compared to Leslie Groves, who is the military leader of the Manhattan Project, uh, Oppenheimer was almost his complete opposite. Whereas uh, Groves was this real hard-driving military man who was always you know, striving to make sure that he was under budget and ahead of schedule with his deadlines, mm -hmm. Oppenheimer was a bit more charismatic. He was always one person that would entertain multiple approaches to a problem and was always willing to seek out compromise. But between the two of them, uh, Groves really saw in Oppenheimer this person that wanted to participate and wanted to contribute to the war effort. So how did the area change with all these new residents arriving here? In short, it changed a lot. Oppenheimer's job was to recruit the brightest minds from universities throughout the country to Los Alamos. Convincing folks to move their families to a remote location to work on a government project that he couldn't elaborate, however, was a challenging task. Many scientists were accompanied by their families, which produced its own problems because Los Alamos was a military installation without the amenities of a normal town. In spite of the rush construction and the need for secrecy, a sense of community quickly formed. One of the biggest challenges with all of this construction was trying to make this place secure. And I want to show you an area, it's a little bit of a reconstruction of how they kept this area secure during the middle of wartime. Let's do it. So with all these new residents arriving here, how did they manage to keep it all a secret? Well, take a look at the building behind us. This is a reconstruction of uh, a guard station that replicates one of the most famous photos of wartime Los Alamos. Of course, General Groves was a master of compartmentalizing every aspect of the Manhattan Project. Of the 130,000 people that were working throughout the nation on the Manhattan Project, people were pretty much relegated to knowing only what they were working on. And that also applied in here in Los Alamos because once you pass this guard station, this wasn't the only gate and this wasn't the only fence. In fact, once you got in, there were individual laboratories that were also fenced in as well that you had to go through other guard stations. Okay every bit of this was designed to keep things as secret as possible. You keep free exchange inside, but total secrecy outside. Well, why don't we go back to the Bradbury and we can talk a little bit more about the science that was being done during the Let's Manhattan do it. Project. So fuel for the bombs was being made in Washington and Tennessee. What exactly was going on here? Well, scientists at Los Alamos were confident that they could use uh, both uranium and plutonium to sustain a chain reaction to produce an explosion. A lot of science and a lot of engineering needed to be done in order to actually start that chain reaction. And the majority of that research was actually being done here in Los Alamos. In the end, they would eventually choose two types of ways to assemble this fuel uh, to produce this explosion, what are known as the gun method and uh, the implosion method. And Los Alamos scientists would actually use both. Now the gun assembly is actually very simple. You basically take one piece of uranium and you shoot it through a gun into another piece, it assembles and produces an explosion. While implosion is a bit more complicated. You take a sphere of material and high explosives surrounding it. You compress it together and that produces a chain reaction. And so this bomb in front of us, little boy, this was the gun assembly and behind me is Fat Man. That was actually the implosion assembly. But of course it wasn't just figuring out the assemblies that was important. There was also the mechanisms behind making sure that these reactions worked. And that included a lot of material science and a lot of electronics engineering. About a four-hour drive from Los Alamos, the Alamogordo Bombing Range, now called the White Sands Missile Range, was pinpointed as the test site. The nearest town was 20 miles from Ground Zero. Even still, Groves was extremely concerned about the after effects of the blast. He had intelligence agents locate and map everyone living within a 40-mile radius of the site. Engineers constructed a 100-foot steel tower with the bomb, nicknamed Gadget, placed on top. The bomb containing plutonium from Hanford would be detonated by the implosion method. 
there was still much anxiety swirling around the prospect of the first nuclear detonation in Los Alamos. The now president, Harry Truman, awaited news of the test, which would inform his actions and decisions at the Potsdam Conference with other allied leaders a day later. Despite uncooperative weather, conflicting experimental results, fears and reservations from scientists, and mishaps at the site, the world changed at 5.29 a.m. on July 16, 1945. In the first fractions of a second, the astounding power of the fissioning atoms weren't visible to the naked eye until a bright and blinding flash of light burst forward. What would come next was a red-orange fireball, hotter than the sun's surface, which flattened and rose into a distinctive mushroom cloud. Years later, Oppenheimer reflected on the moment. He fittingly quoted a famous Hindu text, the Bhagavad Gita. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Oppenheimer understood that this new power unleashed by humanity would not only influence the war's end, but impact life on this planet forever. Before the success or failure of the Trinity test, President Harry Truman made his decision to use the bomb on Japan as soon as it was ready. We shall completely destroy Japan's power to make war. We've now traveled back to the National World War II Museum to uncover what happened after the successful detonation of the gadget in the desert of New Mexico. Hi everyone, my name is Jasmine Gray and I'm a student from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Right now I'm here with Dr. Kristen Burton. She is the museum educator and we're here on the Road to Tokyo Gallery to learn more about the story. Dr. Kristen, what influenced President Truman to move forward with the weapon? Well, Jasmine, it's important to keep in mind that Truman, who was vice president under Roosevelt, had no previous knowledge about the Manhattan Project. So when FDR passed away on April 12, 1945, and Truman then became president of the United States, he very quickly had to be brought up to speed. So on April 25th, he met with an interim committee that consisted of key scientists who worked on the Manhattan Project, including J. Robert Oppenheimer and Enrico Fermi. And based on those meetings with this committee, Truman learned about the Manhattan Project, the atomic bomb, as well as potential uses for this new powerful weapon. Simultaneously, the U.S. military was also planning an amphibious landing on one of the Japanese home islands of Kyushu. This planned landing required almost 1,000 ships and over 300,000 men. Military analysts estimated American casualties at one million men. What did the committee recommend? Well, some scientists on the committee thought it might be a good idea to do a demonstration, detonating one of the atomic bombs for a few delegates from the United Nations. But if this demonstration failed, it would be a wasted opportunity. Therefore, the committee ultimately concluded that the best possible option on the table was military use of the bomb. And based on that recommendation, and after much deliberation, Truman decided to go forward with military use. Mm. So, so what happened next? Well, Truman went to the Potsdam Conference that began on July 17th of 1945, one day after the Trinity test happened in New Mexico. And while he was there, he worked with the other Allied leaders, Joseph Stalin from the Soviet Union and Winston Churchill from the United Kingdom, and together they drafted the Potsdam Declaration. And in this declaration, they called for Japan's unconditional surrender. Meanwhile, Leslie Groves was compiling a list of cities in Japan that could serve as potential targets. This declaration was delivered to Japan on July 26, 1945, but it was met with silence. Meanwhile, the parts for both bombs were either ferried or flown to Tinian Island, where final bomb assembly took place. Once complete, the bombs were loaded onto heavy B-29 bomber planes that took off for Japan. So, when exactly were the bombs dropped? On the early morning hours of August 6, 1945, 11 days after Japan received the Potsdam Declaration, a B-29 bomber called the Enola Gay took off from Tinian Island and headed for Hiroshima, Japan. At approximately 9.15 in the morning, a gun method uranium bomb exploded 2,000 feet above the city of Hiroshima, and it exploded above the city in order to maximize its impact. And the bomb's resulting blast was the equivalent of roughly 15,000 tons of TNT. The bomb destroyed five miles of the city and resulted in approximately 140,000 deaths. 
In the days after, the Japanese government did not meet to discuss the surrender term of the Potsdam Conference, but the Japanese foreign minister tried to arrange a meeting with the Soviet Union to mediate negotiations for a surrender. However, the Soviet Union declared war on Japan on August 9th, three days after the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. What were the effects on the ground? Well, Jasmine, for this, I think it would be good if we took a look at some of the historical footage from the museum's collection. So Jasmine, let's take a look at an artifact from one of the bomb sites. Here we have the vase that was recovered by Lieutenant E.L. Wiley from Nagasaki. What do you notice about this vase? There are some black spots covering this side of the vase, but they're not on the other side. That's right. Those black spots are flash burns caused by the intense heat that came from the detonation of the atomic bomb. And you can tell that this side of the vase was facing the atomic bomb at the moment of the blast, whereas the other one was not. And that just shows you the intensity of the heat and the reactive causes and the devastating effect made by the atomic bomb. So where exactly does this leave Japan? Well, after the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Emperor of Japan, Hirohito, finally accepted the conditions of the Potsdam Declaration. So on August 15, 1945, he announced Japan's surrender via a radio broadcast, which was known as the Jeweled Voice broadcast because this was the first time that many people in Japan had ever heard the emperor's voice. But it's worth noting that throughout the entirety of his speech, he never once used the word surrender. Let's take a walk to the end of the gallery to look at some iconic footage from the end of World War II. What's going on here? So here we see some footage from the signing of the surrender document. And this happened on the deck of the battleship USS Missouri. Uh, and this happened September 2nd, 1945. And as you can see in the footage, we have both officials from the United States and also from Japan who were present for the signing of this document. The moment this document was signed, Japan fell under the power of the Supreme Commander of the Allied Powers and that was General Douglas MacArthur. From this point on, the United States would occupy Japan, and Japan would remain under U.S. occupation until 1952. As the story of World War II comes to a close, in some ways, the story of atomic energy is just beginning. We'll find out more in the next segment. All right, let's take a look at the answer to the poll question. What is Trinitite? The answer is C, a glass-like mineral created from the first atomic bomb blast. Trinitite is a byproduct of the Trinity test as the intense heat reacted with sand. I actually have a piece of Trinitite right here. Check it out. This, ladies and gentlemen, is real Trinitite. And my question as I'm holding this and smelling it and looking at it is, uh, Sharon, is this dangerous? Do I not need to be touching this right now? It's fine to touch it. Okay. Don't eat it. <laughs> no, Don't no, eat no, 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 no. Okay. So, so it is. It has some radioactivity. It's uh, at about background, what we call background radioactivity. You know, radioactivity to some people is very scary, but we depend on radioactivity, that sun up in the sky, 
is a big fusion reactor. <laughs> so okay. um, you can get radioactivity when you fly. You know, it's we we live in it. So uh, my advice to you is, you know, okay to touch it, wash your hands, don't eat it. Okay, uh, I need some Kleenex ASAP, and I need you to <laughs> wet it, and I need to yeah, wash my hands. Okay, well this is Trinity, ladies and gentlemen. Um, th this is this is amazing how this was formed. So next up, let's review what the students reported in that last segment. Um, the deadliest war in human history was now officially over in September of 1945. We have here some newspapers from the museum's collection from the days after the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki with dramatic headlines of the destruction. As you can imagine, the feelings of these scientists and average workers at the Manhattan Project sites were mixed about the usage and aftermath of the bombing. The workers who only knew a little bit about their jobs at places like Hanford or Oak Ridge, they soon understood their piece of the larger puzzle in August 1945. There was comfort that the war had ended, remorse about the civilian casualties, surprise about the lasting effects of the bombings in Japan, and uncertainties about the future. Now, some of these uncertainties centered on the tense and fragile relationships between countries after the war was over. Who would have the capability of building the bomb next? And if they did, what would stop them from using it? That reality was realized in 1949, y'all, when the Soviet Union tested their first atomic bomb. Well, with me again is the brilliant, almighty, amazing, <laughs> Sharon Squassoni, um, what were some of the long-term and short-term effects of the atomic weapons on the Japanese populations? So we saw, um, we just saw pictures from the aftermath of the bomb. Uh, many people died instantly. They were vaporized by the heat. There were blast effects. Uh, there was short-term radiation, and there was longer-term radiation. Um, there were many more cancers in the years following the war. Uh, and we've actually been involved in the Japanese on a, a long, long-term radiation study to determine those effects. Remember, we didn't know a lot about radiation and the effects back then, and in the ensuing decades, we've learned a lot more. Gotcha. So uh, tell us a little bit more about the reaction of scientists, the scientists who actually created these weapons. So as you could see from the headlines, um, some of the scientists were, uh, <laughs> well, some of the scientists were proud of their accomplishment. Right, right. It was a fantastic science uh, right. experiment. And others were very afraid mm. of what we had created yep. and where it would go forward. Um, and in the time immediately after the war, um, the U.S. kept up the level of secrecy on uh, the project. And for scientists, secrecy is like the death of knowledge, right? We need to um, share our collaboration. And so many of the scientists were actually politically mobilized. Uh, they wrote letters to the president. They testified before Congress. They wanted to get engaged. Mm. Uh you said they wanted to get engaged, but what exactly were they informing the public about? So a few months after the bombing, uh, actually one month after the bombing, um, the scientists mobilized around the project site. So in Chicago, it was the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists of Chicago, and Los Alamos had a similar group, and eventually it became, there was a federation of atomic scientists. And, uh, but this bulletin group in Chicago decided they were going to put out a newsletter um, and they were going to try and educate the public about the risks of nuclear weapons. Um, and so that's what they did. And that was the birth of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. And it's still being published today. Really? So does that answer my, my next question, which is how exactly did all these super smart scientists make average people, your average human being, aware, people like my grandfather and his family, aware of the issues and risks at hand? Right, so uh, a couple years later, in 1947, they decided they needed to put something simple up. You know, so um, one of the um, atomic scientists from the project, uh, his wife, Marta um, Langsdorf, was a, an artist, and she put together what became known as the Doomsday Clock. Mm. You can see it there on the one of the early covers and at the time it was set to 
I forget whether it was seven or eight minutes to midnight, and that was supposed to be an easy way for the public to say, how close are we from, from disaster? You know, over the time, the doomsday clock has come to uh, think a little bit more broadly. We now uh, um, look at the impact of climate change uh, on, um, you know, the, the fate of humans, but mostly it's about, we created this technology, all this good technology, how do we make sure it's used for the good of humankind rather than uh, for bad purposes? Wow, wow. I hope everyone watching this is feeling uh, empowered and, and, and smarter because of this, because honestly, your answers are helping me to just get in the mindset of a civilian back then and what they were going through and the fears and the scientists with, oh my gosh, we created a monster and what do we do now? So I really appreciate that. Let's go to a, let's go to a video question, if you don't mind. Okay. All right. Hi, we're fifth graders from Tal Elementary School in Kerrville, Texas. We heard that by dropping the atomic bomb, we saved lives. How can that be true? So that's a fantastic and complicated question. Kids, what you need to remember is that the cost in human lives of World War II was enormous. So military and civilian, 60 to 65 million people died. Just for the US military, we lost about 400,000 service people. So when our leaders were thinking about this atomic bomb, they were thinking, well, maybe this is a way to shorten the war. Maybe we can save lives. Now, it's a very complicated calculation. Mm -hmm. And um, certainly, there were over 200,000 lives in Japan lost of civilians. So it's always tough. These are questions of you know, war and peace. Very tough, very tough. Um, that's why it's just better if everyone could just get along. That's how, <laughs> that's how I feel. Um, let's go to a live question right now, somewhere in America. Let's see. All right, this is from Colin. What up, Colin? Um, his question is, why did the glass turn green after the explosion? Great question. So the bomb goes off. There's a big, the iconic mushroom cloud. It sucks up all the sand mm -hmm. in the desert. Mm -hmm and it gets superheated and it drops back down as this kind of glass, as it, as it cools, this glass structure. So what, uh, you know, if you think about glazes for ceramics, what makes different colors? Well, it's the minerals in the sand. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this trinitite was green, uh, but some of it, there were some other colors because what else evaporated uh, in, the, in the bomb? It was the, the iron and steel in the in the tower that supported the bomb, and also there was a lot of copper cabling uh, for the wiring. So there are different colors of trinitite, but a lot of it is green. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, thank you so much for your insight, Professor Squassoni. We will chat more about the bulletin after our next segment, but let's now open up our final poll question. Godzilla, the iconic Japanese monster debuted for the first time on film in 1954. True or false, Godzilla was a response to the fears of nuclear destruction during World War II and the Cold War. A, true. B, false. I would like you all to vote right now. And let's turn back to Isaac to learn a bit more about Los Alamos National Laboratory today. Hey everyone, we're back in Los Alamos with Elliot from the Bradbury Science Museum to learn about the different jobs here during the past and present. Where are we right now? So right now we're standing in front of the uh, barracks and former dormitories of the WACs. Who are these WACs? Well, actually, let me go show you inside. WAC stands for Women's Army Corps, and they were an auxiliary unit of the U.S. Army. Today, women are integrated into the U.S. military, but back then, each branch of the military had an auxiliary unit for women. Like Hanford and Oak Ridge, Los Alamos needed an influx of workers during the war, and women helped fill these needs both in a civilian and military capacity across the lab. Could you tell us about this place? So this barracks was actually designed by the U.S. military. Remember when we were over at the Fuller Lodge building and we were yeah. talking about just how much construction had to go on? Well, the military was building facilities like this. This was a barracks that was actually designed to house members of the wax. And so people would be spending the evenings here and then going to their jobs in downtown in Los Alamos. So, wax women fill the 
variety of jobs here during World War II. What kind of, or how the Lao change after World War II is over? Well, that's a really good question because with all this construction and all the stuff that was built up here, almost immediately after the end of the Second World War, uh, Los Alamos pretty much dropped off. Uh, from about a peak of 6,000 people working at Los Alamos during the height of the Manhattan Project, less than a thousand remained by the end of 1946. However, between the end of the Second World War and the end of 1946, this was still part of the Manhattan Project and this was still run by the army. And so General Groves actually had a directive for the people that remained at Los Alamos that they were to continue developing and improving the nation's nuclear deterrent. And why don't we go over to the Bradbury Science Museum and we can talk a little bit more about that. Let's do it. So what kind of work is at the lab today? So the work that's done at Los Alamos National Laboratory basically covers every single scientific discipline that you can imagine. Everything from metallurgy and chemistry and theoretical physics to biology and nanotechnology as well. There are mm -hmm. over 11,000 people that work at the laboratory and if you can name the discipline, they <laughs> do that work. One that always comes to mind is my sister who's actually a geologist that works at Los Alamos National Laboratory. In addition to working with volcanology and seismology, she's responsible for doing a lot of de seismic detection of underground nuclear tests that other nations might be doing. So what kind of career paths are at the lab today? So the career paths are basically as diverse as the people that work here. Uh, you've got, like I said, you've got physicists, you've got chemists, you've got engineers, people that are involved in some of the largest structures of the, of the universe, astrophysicists, and then mm -hmm. people that are involved in some of the smallest items, such <laughs> as nanotechnology. So if you name it, Los Alamos is doing it. Thank you so much for everything today. I learned a lot. My pleasure, Isaac. The dropping of the atomic bomb proves to be one of the most important events in the 20th century. Right here in the United States, scientific experimentation took us from the first sustained chain reaction, which couldn't even power a light bulb in late 1942, to the test and usage of destructive atomic weapons less than three years later. The pace of innovation is staggering. These efforts not only involved famous scientists, but 130,000 average Americans, many of them not even knowing where the details of their work may lead. As some communities were moved out of these sites, new ones were constructed almost overnight to meet unprecedented production goals. Rapid migration and growth sometimes meant societal tension and inequity. The bomb's history and legacy is complicated, and still is to this day. 75 years later, Many continue to debate the usage of bombs on Japan. After World War II's end, the stockpile of weapons, thousands of times more powerful than Little Boy and Fat Man, dominated Cold War strategy. Today, national labs like Los Alamos address nuclear threats while also pioneering amazing science. We can both marvel at the remarkable advancements while also considering their consequences, many of which still resonate today. Thank you so much to all of these amazing students for their thorough reporting. I was very impressed. Now, let's take a look at the answer to the final poll question. True or false? Godzilla was a response to the fears of nuclear destruction during World War II and the Cold War. The answer is A. True. In the 1954 film Godzilla, or Gojira in Japanese, uh, was, was awakened from a hydrogen bomb, bomb blast. It is a metaphor for the destructive capabilities of atomic weapons. Wow. Well, we're back with Sharon to talk about some of the work that she does today with the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. Now, the Bulletin just set the doomsday clock a couple weeks ago. Did you help decide where to set the clock? I did, uh, but I am one of about 20 members mm -hmm. of the Science and Security Board at the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. And um, as I may have mentioned already, we take into account uh, what's happening with nuclear weapons, but also climate change. And a little bit now we're talking, we're thinking about emerging technologies like artificial intelligence and gene cloning, those kinds of things. We did, oh, you're gonna ask me. 
What's yeah. the clock? Yeah, like like what does that mean when you say you set the clock? Because uh. I set my, 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 my iPhone. I mean, I set that, but <laughs> I'm sure it's a little right. bit. Right. So with this iconic uh, clock setting, what we, we set it either closer or further away from midnight. So the closer it is to midnight, the closer we are to, or the higher our nuclear risks have gone. And we set the clock a few weeks ago to 100 seconds before midnight. Okay, prior to you all setting it, was it closer or further away from 100 seconds? It was further away. It had been at um, two minutes to midnight. Now, to give you a little perspective, the last, the time when it was set at two minutes to midnight was in 1953, when the Soviets tested their first hydrogen bomb because scientists at the bulletin thought this is a really big development this is you know these these bombs are huge and very destructive so that gives you a sense so why did we set it at 100 seconds of midnight uh, we have no arms control going on with uh, Russia all the nuclear weapon states are modernizing their platforms everything uh, their you know so their aircraft and submarines and missiles um, uh, North Korea says it doesn't want to get rid of its nuclear weapons and doesn't want to talk to us. And Iran has just said it's going to drop out of a uh, very important treaty, mm -hmm. the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which keeps them from getting nuclear weapons. That's a lot of information and it's kind of heavy. So uh, <laughs> for the students watching this, I want them to know how empowered they really are. So is there anything that they can do out there to minimize their risk today? So you're doing one of the most important things right now, which is getting educated about nuclear weapons and the threats. Another thing is political action. I know you guys are too young to vote, but your parents aren't too young to vote, and it doesn't matter what party, you need to exercise your political rights. You can write letters to your congressmen and your senators. You can become nuclear physicists or aerospace engineers. You know, there are a lot of different ways to get involved. I think our message is really one of optimism. We, we created this technology, and so we should be able to create some other technology or approaches to turn the hands back on the clock. Very true. Now, the student reporters left us with their final thoughts. So my question is, what are your biggest takeaways? This is a big question, but what are your biggest takeaways overall about the Manhattan Project? So honestly, it's hard not to be impressed with what all these women and men did uh, during the Manhattan Project. I mean, just an enormous undertaking. They worked around the clock. They did what no one had ever done before. And the end result was that World War II was over. So, you know, but you also have to put it in the broader context. Two bombs ended the war, but over the course of history, we built more than 30,000 bombs ourselves, so did the Soviets. Mm -hmm. We've been able to destroy the planet many times over. And so now it's really time to look at those risks and do something about them. Let's get rid of some of those nuclear weapons. You know, you don't have to totally believe in nuclear disarmament to understand that mm -hmm. we at least need to reduce the stockpiles and reduce the risks. Thank you so, so, so much, Sharon, for your insight and your perspective and for answering all of these student questions out here today. Um, we also want to thank all of our filming partners, including the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, the Department of Energy, the Manhattan Project National Historical Park, the White Sands Missile Range, the Bradbury Science Museum, the City of Los Alamos, and the Los Alamos National Laboratory. Tell us your thoughts your thoughts about this program by filling out the survey in the box below the screen or at slido.com or you can hit us up on twitter using the hashtag mpeft signing off from the national world war ii museum right here in my city new orleans louisiana it's your boy d1 along with my amazing co-host professor sharon squassoni thank you for watching Boom.